Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2013 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its Cooperating Society are proud to present Mr. Caleb Brown. Caleb is a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Caleb is originally from Northern British Columbia, but he grew up in Red Deer, Alberta. He received his bachelor's degree in zoology in the Department of Biologi Biological Sciences at the University of Calgary, and spent three summers during his undergraduate years working in the prep lab here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. After completing his BSc, he stayed at the U of C to pursue his master's degree, again in the Department of Biological Sciences. For his thesis, Caleb investigated the diversity of small-bodied plant-eating dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous of Canada. After successfully defending his thesis, Caleb moved to Toronto to pursue a PhD program in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. For his dissertation, he is studying variation and evolutionary morphology in horned dinosaurs from Dinosaur, Dinosaur Provincial Park. Over the years, Caleb has conducted fieldwork in Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories, China, and Mongolia. Today, Caleb will discuss the preservational biases affecting small dinosaurs, specifically in the dinosaur park formation, and how these biases can skew our understanding of dinosaur diversity and ecology. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Caleb Brown. Thanks. Thanks, Francois. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is this working? OK. Um, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming for the talk. I'm excited to be able to present my research to so many people. And uh, a big thank you for the Tyrrell as well for allowing me to come and, and uh, share my research with you. Uh, as Francois alluded to, I kind of grew up academically, uh, got my start in paleo here at the Tyrrell, both volunteering initially and then uh, working for the Tyrrell. So it's great to come home and uh, present what I've been doing away. Uh, so, uh, I should also uh, mention a bit of a caveat that there's going to be a lot of uh, dinosaur silhouettes in this talk and a lot of uh, graphs. I will try to explain them all, so, but that's just a bit of a warning there. Uh, what I'm presenting on here is the results of two recently published papers that came out at the end of last year and the beginning of this, this year. And although I'm presenting up here, um, they were co-authored by uh, various authors who helped contribute to the research. And there's also uh, various people who contributed to the collection of the data and discussions and such. So I need to acknowledge, acknowledge those people off the bat. One of the most uh, intriguing things about dinosaurs is their, is their size. And they got, they got really large. This is just a, uh, an image of some of the dinosaurs from the Morrison Formation of the, uh, the Western United States with the the largest sauropod known, at least the speculation about how big it would be in the background. Um, so they did get huge, but there were a lot of small dinosaurs as well. And that's actually what I'm going to highlight today in this talk. Now we can quantify dinosaur body size by looking at what's called their, their size distribution. So just to explain this plot a bit, the, the horizontal axis is the mass, how much the dinosaurs weighed. And the vertical axis is the diversity, how many species there were. And what you can see is that as you get larger, you get more species. There's more species of large dinosaurs than there are small dinosaurs, which is interesting. And this is what's called a negative skew in the body size distribution. You can see there's this tail kind of towards the, the small bodied size with most of the, most of the weight at the large body, bodied size part of the spectrum. And this is very interesting ecologically and it's been noted by many authors over the years. Uh, uh, you, and you can also see it at, at many scales. You can see it at the global scale. This is a global example but you can see it at the continental scale and also at the formational scale. And it's interesting because when we compare that to something like mammals, we see the exact opposite trend. Um, so these are animals that are alive today, the, the, the living mammals, and we see a much higher diversity of the small mammals. There's much more species of small mammals than large mammals. And this makes sense when you grow out today, you'd expect to see multiple species of bats and shrews and rodents, but very few species of elephants. And so this is what's called a a positive skew uh, with most of your diversity at the small part of the, the size range of the organisms. And this isn't a difference between dinosaurs and mammals, though. What this is is a difference between basically dinosaurs and everything else. Uh, if we look at most other living vertebrate groups, they show a, pro a prominent positive skew in their, in their size distribution. I should mention that these, uh, these distributions are from a recent paper by O'Gorman and Holm. So, What's happening here with dinosaurs? Why are they showing a pattern different from everything else that we know that's alive today? Uh, and there's 
ecological theories that predict why we're getting this, this, this positive skew, but we're not sure what's causing this negative skew. And this is actually a really important question biologically because the body size of an organism and the, the body size distribution have effects for many aspects of its, of its biology and its ecology, such as community structure and niche partitioning, uh, energetics, uh, ontogeny, uh, competition, and, and especially for the dinosaurs, extinction. So it's really important to understand what the body size distribution is. And you can interpret this in two ways. You can interpret this as this being a, a biological cause for there being a different in the di difference in the distribution. But there might be an alternate explanation, and that's the, a, a geological or taphonomic reason. Uh, that being that um, small dinosaurs, small animals, are less likely to be preserved. So taphonomy is basically what happens to an animal after it dies. Um, it can get uh, uh, decomposed and scavenged and broken apart, or it could get fossilized nicely. And uh, if there is a, a, a bias against small animals, then this might explain this, this distribution. And this is, this is not a new idea. It's been suggested by many authors over the years. And it's also um, been supported by work on extant animals, people working in uh, mainly African ecosystems. You, can, you notice that the abundance of skeletons of small animals is less than that of large animals, regardless of how diverse the actual animals are. But regardless of this, no one's actually gone and tried to test this in a, uh, a dinosaur-dominated terrestrial ecosystem. And that's what we wanted to do with this particular project. So we needed a model, first of all. We needed somewhere to go to test this. And we couldn't think of a better model to use than, dinosaur, than the Dinosaur Park formation in Dinosaur Park, Alberta. Uh, many of you already know about Dinosaur Park. It's not far from here. But just to recap, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, it's from the late Campanian. Uh, it's in southern Alberta, so near the town of Brooks. It's the, one of the reasons it makes a really good sample is that, or a really good model, is that it's heavily sampled. We've been working there for over 100 years, collecting and also researching. And uh, it's also very diverse. We have about 50 dinosaur species known from there, and about 100 uh, of vertebrates known from the, from the park. And when we look at the dinosaurs that are preserved there, they also show a nice range in body mass. We have small ones as much as tenth of a kilogram to about 4,500 kilos, so a good range in body size to test the effect of body size on how they're preserved. Just to show you what the outcrop like, this is, this is Dinosaur Park. It's a beautiful area, lots of exposure, and that's probably why we've been collecting there for so long. It's highly fossiliferous, lots of skeletons, so it's got a really good sample size. When we look at the animals that we're, that we're examining in the Dinosaur Park formation, uh, we see some of the, the characteristic animals from Alberta, things like Stegosaurus, uh, uh, Chasmosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Dromaeosaurus, those are all from the Dinosaur Park formation. So that's the, 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 the assemblage that we're looking at in this case. This is a, a really nice illustration by Julius. And if we break that down, looking at the diversity with these silhouettes, we see this pattern where it's dominated by the hadrosaurs and the ceratopsians, the, the duckbill dinosaurs and the, the horned dinosaurs. We do see a fairly high diversity of some other groups, but most of the diversity is in those two large groups. And when we look at, when we quantify this using this uh, dinosaur body size distribution, we get this pattern, and this fits this negative skew. We have more of these large dinosaurs than small dinosaurs. So this fits this, this, uh, this uh, pattern, and it's, as such, it's a good model for exploring this phenomenon. So in order to test this, we took this, this faunal list. We took the 50 dinosaurs that we know come from the dinosaur park formation, and we quantified them. We, we, we um, assessed various aspects of their biology and how they're preserved. And the first one is, the most important. The first is, is how much they weighed, how big they were. Because if we're looking at the effects of body size, we need to know how big they were. And we did this following the equations of Anderson et al. 85 with the updates of Campione and Evans 2012. I'll just explain these in a, in a few slides. And so for the bipedal tax, so for the tax that walk on two legs, we looked at the circumference of the, of the femur. And for the taxa that walked on four legs, the quadrupedal taxa, we looked at the combined circumference of the, of the femur and the humerus, so the upper arm bone and the, the thigh bone. And the reason we looked at these two metrics is that um, they correlate very nicely with the body size of the animals. This is a sample of 200 mammals that are alive today and 47 reptiles that are alive today. We know the masses of those animals and we know how big the limbs are and you can see there's a very tight correlation from this. What this means is that if we go out and measure a dinosaur, we can measure how big it's, it, the circumference of its limbs are and extrapolate from that and get an idea of what the animal weighed. We also get an idea of the error associated with that estimate, extrapolating from the modern data. We also used circumference because it was a, uh, 
a metric that was less prone to error than something like length, um, which shows a higher rate of, a rate of error for estimating uh, based on the modern animals. So once we figured out how much these different animals weighed, we wanted to quantify basically various aspects and how they're preserved. We call these these four different taphonomic indices. Um, the first of these was when the specimen was found, when the, sorry, the first specimen of each species was found. It doesn't, it doesn't mean when they were named, it doesn't necessarily mean when they were recognized as a distinct species, just when they were first collected or, or first found in the field. The second thing is when they were described. So that when the first specimen or when that species as, itself, as, a, as a taxon was described for the first time. This is often when it was named, but not necessarily. Sometimes something is described and then not named to later or not even named at all. Once we deal with when the things were found and described, we also wanted to get an idea of how complete the skeletons were, how much we knew about the different, uh, uh, how much we knew about the anatomy of the animal. And we did this by looking at the, the completeness of the skeleton. Um, this is modified from uh, Manning and Upchurch. And we did this to, uh, it's important to stress that that's at, at, at the species level. So for each species, we looked at every specimen that you could put in that species until we either got 100% completeness or we ran out of specimens, in which case that was the percentage completeness known. And we did this by dividing the skeleton into nine different anatomical regions and then scoring it between one and zero and then averaging that across the skeleton. So I'm going to show you how this works with a few examples. We have uh, Stegosaurus validum, uh, one of the dome-headed dinosaurs, one of the pachycephalosaurs, and Centrosaurus apertus, one of the horned dinosaurs. And the white bones here are the, the parts of the anatomy that we know, that we found to date. And if we quantify what aspect of the skull we know, in both cases we have complete or nearly complete skulls. But when we look at the neck, when we look at the cervical vertebrae, we see that we don't have any for stegosaurus, but we have uh, several complete series for centrosaurus that again gets a one. And we complete this, we fill this all the way down until we've accounted for the entire skeleton. And at the end, we end up with 37% complete or around there for stegosaurus and 100% complete for centrosaurus. So we did this for each of the dinosaurs from the dinosaur park formation. And then we wanted to quantify one other aspect of how they're preserved. And this is called the taphonomic mode. And this is modified from, from Eberth and Curry. And what this represents is basically how the bones were found relative to the other bones of the animal. So we have articulated uh, on the far left here the, the black uh, examples. And this is when you have skeletons where all the bones of the animal are in the right anatomical position. Um, they're, all rel they're, they're all in the right, right spots. Um, then you have associated, which is indicated in gray, where you have the bones of the specimen are in the same area. They're, they're all lumped together, but they're all kind of mixed around. They're not in, in the correct life position. And then you have a situation where you have isolated, where the bone is removed from the context of the rest of the skeleton. You just find the bone all by itself. And it's important to stress that this is not necessarily dependent on completeness. You can have an example of a, a species that's known from only an, a hand or only a skull that's articulated but it's very, very incomplete. Likewise, you can have a situation where you have a specimen that, or a taxon that's well represented in terms of the skeleton. We know most of its anatomy, but it's only from an associated skeleton, not from an articulated skeleton. And these three categories represent a disarticulation gradient. So when an animal is living, it's obviously articulated. And when it dies, it's articulated. And then depending on the factors that happen to it after it, after it dies, um, the taphonomy, it can break down into something that's associated or something that's isolated. And since we're scientists, we're in the business of, of, of testing hypotheses. So we put up a, a null hypothesis and we try to disprove it and then move on to the next stage. So in this case, the, the null hypothesis is that we don't really see any correlation. We don't see any interaction between these different uh, taphonomic indices and the body size and how big the animal is. If that's the case, then we don't have a, a prominent taphonomic size bias in the dinosaur park formation. On the contrary, if we do see a correlation between size and these various preservational metrics, then we do have this bias. And the strength of that correlation is related to the strength of that bias, if that makes sense. So we're going to go through a bit of the results first off. I'm going to start with completeness. So what we're looking at here is the, 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 how the body size of the animal interacts with how complete the, or the, the, the species is known. So I'm just going to explain this plot. First of all, we have on the x-axis, the, the horizontal axis, we have the mass in terms of kilograms. And on the vertical axis, we have completeness from 0 to 
And if we plot all of our species on, we see this pattern. Basically, um, the bigger the animal gets in terms of mass, the more complete it is. And the smaller it gets in terms of mass, the less complete it is. And we can fit line to this, and we can fit confidence intervals to this. And there's a very robust correlation between these two factors. We can also investigate which animals are driving this trend. Uh, up at the top right, the really complete, really big animals are the, the horned dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs in general. Uh, the tyrannosaurs are up there as well. Some of the big animals that aren't uh, complete uh, are some of the ankylosaurs. And then in the middle of the graph at the top, we also have the ornithomimids. We have several species that are very complete, but these are only about medium size in terms of the size range. And then as we go down the spectrum, we see a lot of the small theropods and the pachycephalosaurs, the dome-headed dinosaurs that we know from partial skeletons and their medium size. And then at the very end, in terms of the really small ones, we have the birds, which are very small and also very incomplete. Most of those we know from only one or two bones. The interesting thing is that we can then take this and we can also break it down into the different dinosaur groups. We can look at theropods, uh, the, the, the median dinosaurs for the most part, um, separate from everything else and see that the pattern holds there as well. Very strong correlation. We can look at the ornithischians and the pattern holds there as well. In fact, we can break this down into any of the subgroups within dinosaurs. As long as there's a big enough size, uh, sample size and a big enough range of sizes, you get a significant correlation between completeness and between uh, body mass. So it's not interplaying between different groups. This is a, a, a systematic thing that's happening in all these different dinosaur groups individually. We can look at this another way. And instead of looking at the absolute size of the animal, we can just rank them from largest to smallest. Sorry, from, from smallest to largest. So on the left, we have the smallest organisms, or the smallest dinosaurs. On the right, we have the, the largest. And we can plot on there the completeness. In this case, it's a, a bar graph. The, the taller the bar, the more complete the animal. The silhouettes give you an idea of what type of animal it is, and the colors correspond to which group it belongs to. And we can also add to the middle of this graph the different, three different taphonomic modes. Remember, white is isolated, uh, gray is associated, and black is articulated. So black is, in general, the, the, the best preserved, the whole skeleton is preserved. Um, and what we see is that, just visually, there's a nice break here at around 60 kilograms, where below that, you don't have anything that's articulated. And at below that, most things are also very incomplete. So these are your incomplete, isolated taxa. There's another pattern that above about 370, you see almost everything is articulated, and almost everything is very complete. And then in the middle here, you have this mixed assemblage of things, uh, mainly ornithomimids and, and uh, a leptoceratopsid. But this is just kind of me visually breaking this down. It's better to actually try to quantify this and see where the breaks actually fall mathematically. So what we did is we basically changed the, the plot into dots and asked the computer to break this down into as many subsets as possible of two groups and ask where is the biggest difference in terms of completeness. And that's going to be your natural lines in terms of separating this into two different size classes. And what we get is we get the same line at about 60 that I pointed out initially. And this represents the smallest complete species from the park, um, one of the ornithomimids. And the other line that comes out um, is the, the large unnamed ornithomimid that was described a few years ago by, by Longridge. And the interesting thing to point out is that there's actually no overlap between the small tax, the, people, the, 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 the dinosaurs falling below the 60 kilogram threshold, and the large tax, the tax are falling above 370, uh, which is very interesting. So we have these three different size classes. We have the small animals, the small dinosaurs, 25 of those, which are indicated in blue here, which are both incomplete and known from mainly from isolated material. We have the large taxa, which is about 20 of those. Um, they're represented in red. And then we have this intermediate group of about five. But for most of the talk, I'm actually going to lump the two big ones together. And we're going to have two groups, large indicated in blue, or sorry, uh, small indicated in blue, large indicated in red both with the same sample size, with about 25 taxa, which is important. And uh, the threshold between them, uh, between if you call something a small dinosaur and a large dinosaur, is 60 kilograms, which is very convenient for us because that's approximately the same size as the average human being. So you can think of small animals derived from the completeness as being smaller than the average human, large dinosaurs as being larger than the average human. We can also break this down again into ornithischians and theropods and look at this and see where the threshold is within each of those groups. And if we do that, we get an, a, a threshold of about 180 kilograms for ornithischians 
and 60 for theropods. Now 180 might seem a bit different from 60, but given the size range that these animals span, it's actually a very similar number. The interesting thing is that if you look at the proportion of each of these groups falling below that threshold of completeness, you see a huge different difference. Uh, only 25%, only a quarter of the ornithischians fall into this, this small and incomplete size range, um, whereas three quarters of the theropods fall into that range. So next we're going to look at taphonomic mode. We're going to look at uh, how these specimens are associated with each other when they're found and collected. And remember this represents a disarticulation gradient from articulated to associated to isolated, indicated in black, gray, and white. If we plot up the mass, again, going from smallest on the left to largest on the right, we see that all of the big dinosaurs are characterized by being articulated, and almost all of the small dinosaurs are characterized by being isolated. And the interesting thing is that the, the, the ones that are, that are large and articulated, that's what's actually causing this negative skew in the body size distribution. And if you just looked at the isolated animals, or just looked at the isolated and associated um, taxa, or taxa known only from those two taphonomic modes, you would see a more normal body size distribution. You wouldn't see a, a skew to it. And you can look at this correlation using various metrics. And it doesn't matter what metric you use. This is a highly significant correlation between the, the body mass of the dinosaur and how it's, and, and which taphonomic mode it falls into. The other interesting thing we can do is look at the pattern of discovery and description of these animals and look at how that correlates with large and small taxa. So what I'm going to show you is a, there's a timeline along the bottom of the axis here from uh, about 1900 on the left to recently, 2011, on the, on the right there. And I'm just going to show you, using the different silhouettes you saw at the beginning, where the different dinosaurs, wh when they were described. And what you see is that almost all of the diversity was found in the first 40 years. We found most of the things in the first 40 years. And then there was a bit of a gap in the 50s and 60s. And then we picked up again in the 70s. And we really increased our diversity. The important thing is that if we break this down, into the large and small size classes that we defined before, we see the red, the large animals, predominantly found early, and the second wave of discovery has been mainly the small animals. Now, it's cool to point out that some of these animals, like the Spletosaurus and, and Vagaceratops, indicated in gray here, they were described fairly recently, but they were actually found decades earlier. And we didn't realize they were distinct taxa until either the jackets were opened up and, and prepared, and we found that this is something new, or there was a revision on the, on the animals, and we discovered, no, there's differences here that are at the, at the species level. This should be a distinct, distinct animal. So instead of looking at when the different dinosaurs were described, we can also look at when they were discovered, and that might also reveal some interesting patterns. So instead of looking at description, we're going to now look at when they were found. And when we do that, we see an even more dichotomous trend. Um, again, in the first 30 years, we found all the big stuff almost. And we found some of the small stuff. But most of the stuff found since then has been small. And this is just me putting the, the silhouettes on, on the timeline. But we can actually quantify this. We can actually look at the patterns in terms of the rates of discovery and the rates of description. And when we do that, we get some interesting patterns. So on the, on the left, we have discovery rate. And on the right, we have description rate. And for the large taxa, we see a very high initial rate of discovery. And then it plateaus. We've reached kind of this, this asymptote. When we look at the small tax illustrated in blue, we see a very different pattern. It's almost a linear, steady increase in the number of taxa. And uh, we can actually fit some mathematical equation to this. And unsurprisingly, the, the large ones fit a logarithmic mode, which, uh, which suggests that we had a high initial rate, and now we're plateauing. And we might find a few more species, but we're not going to find a lot. Our rate of discovery is really slow. Whereas with the small taxa, it actually fits a power curve. So it's actually a curve where the, the slope is actually increasing slowly through time. So we're increasing the rate that we're finding new small taxa. The really exciting thing about Dinosaur Park, though, is that we also have an idea of who was collecting and when. This is just a, a quick slide that shows the different museums indicated by the different colors and when they were collecting on this timeline. And the bottom of the graph here, this blue, or sorry, this, this gray curve, is the cumulative collection intensity, how many uh, crew years were put into collecting in Dinosaur Park. And you can see that different museums collected at different times. And rather than looking at the rate of discovery against time, which doesn't take into account really high rates of collection in, in the, the, the 1910s and 20s, or really low rates of collection between 1937 and 1950, the, if we plot the discovery rate against the collection intensity, we can actually factor out the different, the different um, pattern terms of how much time is being invested into trying to find new dinosaurs. And when we do that, we get a very interesting curve. 
Uh, so this is all tax indicated in gray here. We see it, it, it's a uh, high rate initially, and it's gradually slowing through time. Uh, so we are finding new ones, but our rate at which we're finding new taxa is slowing. But if we break this down into the small dinosaurs and the large dinosaurs, we see a very distinct dichotomy. Um, all of the large dinosaurs, all the red ones, were found, almost all of them, were found really early, very high rate, and then we plateaued out. We're not finding very many anymore. But the small animals are actually steadily increasing in terms of their diversity. So we're at a very interesting time right now because the diversity of the small ones and the large ones is about the same. And if you look at any point back in history, you have a much higher diversity of the large dinosaurs than the small ones. And if you project these into the future, obviously we can't predict the future, but if these curves hold, it would suggest that in the next few years as we continue to sample, we will actually have a higher diversity of small animals, of the small dinosaurs, than the large dinosaurs. Um, one of the other things that we can look at is uh, how diverse the individual dinosaur families are and if that correlates with mass. And it turns out it does. So here's all the different families. And if we fit a line to that, there's a, there's a correlation. It's not a strong one. And what's causing this correlation is actually the really diverse hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. And if we remove those from the equation, they, th this correlation disappears. But there is a correlation here, which is very interesting as well. So you might be asking the question about, is this affecting small taxa, small species, or is this affecting, affecting small individuals, basically uh, juveniles and subadults of large animals? Because the animal has to go, obviously, from an egg to a large animal, has to pass through a small-bodied stage. What's happening with those guys? So to do this, we looked at, at uh, two of the most abundant animals in the dinosaur park uh, formation. We looked at centrosaurus, and we looked at um, the duckbill dinosaurs, the hadrosaurids. And we tried to quantify the size at the specimen level of all these different specimens and see what the pattern was. So for Centrosaurus, if you look at the back of the skull, there's this uh, bone called the occipital condyle, which is basically the trailer hitch that attaches the head to the rest of the skeleton. This is a very spherical thing. Um, it, it's very easy to find, very easy to diagnose in the, in the bone beds. It's actually what we used in many cases to figure out how many individuals were in the bone beds. But it's also a good metric for the size of the organism. And if we plot out how big these animals were in terms of the abundance of specimens, we see a pattern that looks like this. We have very low abundance of juveniles and subadults, and most of our diversity is around the large subadult to adult range in terms of abundance. Now, we do know that juveniles are present in the formation. Uh, we have other elements that suggest that's the case, um, but they're not there in high abundance, at least not in the occipital condyles, which are very well represented in terms of specimens. And this doesn't matter if we look at it overall, if we break it down by articulated skulls, if we look at all the bone beds or individual bone beds, the pattern is exactly the same. We can do the same thing for the hadrosaurs, the duckbill dinosaurs. In this case, we're looking at, for articulated skulls, we're looking at the length of the skull and the height of the quadrate, the height of the bone of the back of the, back of the skull. And these show the same pattern as well. And again, we know that the juveniles were present in the formation. We do have specimens, uh, associated, or uh, isolated specimens, but they're just not represented by complete skulls, as are the, the adult individuals. So it suggests that this might be acting at the juvenile stage as well for the large animals. And then you might ask the question of, well, is this just unique to the dinosaur park formation? Um, did we just pick a bad model to show this? So the best thing to do would be to compare this to another formation, particularly one that has a similar depositional environment, because that's what we're interested in. We're interested in how the depositional environment affects how these things are being preserved, but that is in a different place in the world. Um, that has different animals running around, different taxa, in this case, different dinosaurs, that's at a different time, and also has a different collection history. Different museums collecting at different times, and do these patterns hold up when we do that? And then compare this to the dinosaur park formation and see if the dinosaur park formation is an outlier or if it actually is representative. To do this, we looked at the Hell Creek formation from Montana, mainly from Montana. Um, here's a beautiful picture of the outcrop. And this formation is characterized by animals like T. rex and triceratops, in general, in generally much bigger on animals than what we see in the dinosaur park formation. When we actually look at the results, I'm just going to go through them quickly, we see the same pattern, if not a more prominent pattern. Uh, here's our correlation between ranked body mass and completeness and taphonomic mode. And you can see, not only do we get a strong correlation, but the threshold at which that, that the, the completeness drops out is at that 60 kilogram range as well. We can look at the taphonomic mode. We see, again, all the big guys are articulated. All the small dinosaurs are isolated. We can also look at the rate of discovery. In this case, it's even more prominent than the dinosaur park formation. The, the large animals, again, we found lots very early, and then it kind of plateaued out, whereas the small animals, in this case, it's exponential. We're finding that many more every, uh, every 
uh, five year bin basically. And at this point in the Hell Creek Formation, we actually have more of the small animals than we do large ones. So it's actually past the point at which the, the Dinosaur Park Formation was at. The other thing that we can do is because we have this data for the Dinosaur Park and the Hell Creek Formation, we can ask the question of how much the historical perspective changes. So if I, if I was giving this talk 30 years ago, what would I be saying about the dinosaur size distribution? What about 100 years ago? Would I be saying the same things or would my view have been changed? So we can actually go back and look at the, the distribution of body sizes historically. So back in 1910, um, the dinosaur park formation in blue and the Hell Creek formation in red, the Hell Creek formation, we almost have all the big guys already back in 1910. We have some of the big guys in dinosaur park and some of the medium sized guys. As we go through time, now we're in 1940, we can see the Hell Creek are finding some of the medium sized dinosaurs. Same with the Dinosaur Park Formation, but now we have almost all the big guys. As we go through, here's 1980, 1990, we're picking up some of the smaller dinosaurs. And here's uh, last year, we picked up almost all these small little guys that weren't represented initially. We can actually quantify using the skew how, um, how negatively skewed these different distributions were. We can plot that through time and see if we see a similar pattern in these two different formations at different times, different places. And we see the pattern is very similar. Uh, we see that as we sample, as we get a better understanding of which animals were there, we see that our, our, our understanding of that distribution shifts from one that's dominated by, by large animals to one that's dominated more by small animals. And ideally, what will happen is through time, as we continue to sample, these lines should level out and reach a plateau. And that's when we have a reasonable understanding of what's actually there of the animals that we could actually sample. So let's go back to our hypotheses, because that's what this is all about. We're trying to fit, uh, make predictions and see if we can actually uh, uh, disprove those predictions. And I hope I've convinced all of you that there's strong correlations between pretty much all of these different indices and body mass. And in each case, all of those can actually quite easily be explained by a single taphonomic bias against small skeletons. Basically, small skeletons are harder to fossilize and then also harder to find than the large skeletons. And if that's the case, then we also have an issue with, basically, with, with occurrence or compositional fidelity. Basically, what we know about the formation in terms of which animals were alive based on the skeletons is not the same as which animals were actually alive. We're missing a lot of the diversity of the small animals. And if you accept that, then that is actually what's causing this negative skew in the dinosaur size distribution. Not, we don't need to invoke um, necessarily uh, ecological or biological, physiological reasons to explain this when it can all be explained by a simple taphonomic bias that's, that's been shown to actually occur in the formation. So let's just go back to some of the recent animals. For example, this is a, an example by Barron's and colleagues from Africa looking at mammals. And again, we have body mass on the bottom getting larger towards the right. And here's some silhouettes indicating what kind of animals fall in those size ranges. And the solid line indicates the diversity in this one area given the animals that are alive, given animals you can go out and see with your binoculars. But if you look at the skeletons in terms of what the diversity was, you see, this, you see the dotted line. And you'll notice that under a certain threshold of about 100 kilograms here, there's a discontinuity between the solid line and the dotted line. You, you have animals that are alive in the assemblage, animals that are alive in that part of the world that you don't generally find as skeletons. And at the smaller you get, the bigger that dichotomy is. So let's just replace our, our mammals here with the dinosaurs in the dinosaur park formation. Let's plot on our threshold. A very similar thing is happening here. We're losing this diversity of these small animals. And this is indicated by these correlations with completeness and taphonomic mode and the date of discovery. And the threshold at which these things are happening, in our case, 60 kilograms based on the completeness, is very similar to 100 kilograms given how big these animals are, given the size range. So a very similar physical um, uh, characteristics for both the modern mammal assemblages and what we're seeing in the dinosaur park formation. So just to take this home, if this is our understanding of the dinosaur uh, assemblage of the dinosaur fauna, we really have to think about what was actually there, but we're just not seeing because of this taphonomic bias. We're looking at this through a filter that's eliminating all the small animals. And this is important because most of our knowledge of the dinosaurs in North America comes from these, these um, uh, dinosaur um, systems that are influenced by large river systems causing this, this skew in the, in, the, uh, in the size distribution. And if we really want to understand the paleoecology, um, we have to understand that we're missing a lot of these small animals. And if we really want to understand the diversity, how many dinosaurs were actually there, 
we need to concentrate on finding these small animals because that's where this hidden diversity lies. There's a lot of these small ones we haven't recognized yet, and I'm going to show some more of those in the future. And this is going to be difficult, though, because as I've shown you, these small animals, the smaller you get, the more rare you become, and also the more incomplete you become. So we have to get good at finding these things, figuring out if these things are unique or not based on partial skeletons. We can't rely on articulated skeletons all the time. But I don't want this to be negative. I don't want this to be all doom and gloom about what we know in terms of the dinosaur assemblages. What I'm going to highlight is some recent advances we've made in terms of discovery of some really small but important fossils, mainly from Alberta, based on mainly incomplete specimens. So here's two new horn dinosaurs. These were named last year by Ryan and colleagues. On the log there, we have UNESCO Ceratops Coppelhussa. This is from Coppelhussa A. This is from um, the Dinosaur Park Formation of Alberta. And in the foreground, we have another animal, Grifficeratops morrisoni. And these are very small animals. I'm going to show you how small in a moment. But they're important because, especially for Grifficeratops, it's the um, smallest known horned dinosaur in North America. And it's also the, the first occurring member of um, the Leptoceratopsidae, its family of dinosaurs in all of North America. So it's really important. But when we look at what we know about both of these, they're based on just isolated jaws. That's it. We don't have the rest of the skeleton. And how small are they? Well, they're about the size of dogs. Um, small dogs or little dogs. Um, so in this case, these, these jaws have told us a lot about the evolution of this group that we didn't know about based on articulated skeletons. If we move on, here's another uh, specimen or another species we described two years ago. Fescalosaurus sustainaboyensis. This one's actually from Saskatchewan, not Alberta. But um, if you look at the size, it's actually a medium-sized animal. It's about 50% complete. But this is the smallest of the plant-eating dinosaurs that was alive at the end of the Cretaceous, um, living with things like T-Rex. We think of T-Rex, Triceratops, and Monosaurus as being really big animals. This indicates that we actually did still have some of these small animals living in that late Cretaceous ecosystem just prior to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Perhaps the best example of a recently found incomplete but very important specimen is Hesperonychus elizabethae. This is also from the Dinosaur Park Formation. Um, it was described uh, a few years ago. And this is important because the, the, the family that it belongs to, the Microraptor um, it's the, the first occurrence of that group in North America. And it's the youngest occurrence of that group by about 45 million years. So based on other specimens, we thought the group went extinct 45 million years ago before this one was found. Um, so it really highlights how important these, these fragmentary and small specimens are. Uh, this is how small it is, about the size of a chicken, and there's one of its claws on a quarter. This was named by uh, Longrich and Curry um, in 2009. Also by Longrich and Curry in 2009, another animal, Albertonychus borealis. This was, dis this was uh, described from the Hell Creek, or sorry, the Horseshoe Canyon Formation of Alberta. And this is interesting because it's thought to represent a, a unique ecological mode. Uh, the authors suggest that it's insectivorous and using these small but powerful arms to break open uh, termite mounds and, and, and eat the, the termites inside. And then finally, I'm going to show you a few things that are, that are new that haven't been named yet, haven't been described, but they're going to be coming out in the next few months. We have this uh, small ornithopod. Um, comes up to your knees. This is from the, horseshoe can oh, sorry, the, the old man formation of Alberta. And this is a, a small bipedal plant-eating dinosaur. The interesting thing about this animal is that if you look at the, the lower leg, the tibia is actually fused to the, to the fibula. And this is a characteristic you see in animals that are very good at running, at very cursorial animals. So this suggests this is a small, speedy plant-eating dinosaur that we didn't know about before. And then um, the one that I'm really excited about, too, is, another, is a new uh, pachycephalosaur, a new dome-headed dinosaur. This is from the, uh, the Milk River Formation of Alberta. And the reason this is important is because it's the oldest known pachycephalosaur in North America, and it's possibly the oldest known pachycephalosaur in the world. And it also shows this already prominent dome that characterizes this group. So we don't know anything about the ghost lineage of this, this group. They've been around for a long time, but we have very little in terms of the fossils. And it actually tells us a lot about the fossil record of this entire group um, based on this, this single specimen. So hopefully I've convinced you that the small dinosaurs are interesting and that we can learn a lot about them, but that there's some problems associated with them and that uh, geology is basically working against us in terms of their discovery. We need to, be, we need to realize that and we need to concentrate on these small animals. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, take any questions if you have any.